I don't want to give, leave the impression with anybody else that we create ourselves wholly, fully. We know when we're whole and full. But in most instances, I would argue that most people get where they are because they've been called to it by somebody else. And they say, Carl, I can't do that. I've never done that. I don't want your time. Yeah, I think you can. All, and, the, and the Catholic mind, you see, goes way, way back. For instance, uh, in the rule we live under, a sixth century document, the fourth degree of humility says, find a wisdom figure, find a spiritual guide, sit with somebody, let them know you, let them help you through the bumps in the road, because everybody needs a companion along the way. Now that doesn't mean, um, it, it doesn't even mean a mentor, it means a companion. It means somebody who will hear you and, and re report back to you what really sounds like a, 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 a kind of depth that resonates with themselves or that they want to know more about or that they know you ought to know more about. So here, here we have then uh, a tradition that itself leaps from wisdom figure to wisdom figure. So uh, I'm a young Catholic girl and I grow up in that environment and I'm suddenly face to face with the heroes of life, not the heroes of the church. Yes, the, the church uh, uh, lets you know that they own them, but that wasn't was what it was about. So many of them confronted the church itself. Catherine of Siena, you know, who just told the Pope what was wrong with him and his, and his papacy. That's no small thing. That's, that's a movement into an internal insight to which my whole life is beholden. And I, I see those people uh, alive around us. I see them in this community. My wisdom figures are in large part walking these halls as we sit here. These women have borne the heat of the day with the scripture in one hand, the rule in the other, and the daily newspaper in front of them. And they've done it for 50, 60, 70 years. And they never ask how much they get paid, and they don't know if they've been paid. They come home, we all eat together, pray together, get up the next morning and do it again. Now that, there, there's something about that that is not everybody's model, but it is a beacon to what everybody else may be looking for. And that is a life that is simple, doesn't ask a lot, doesn't have a lot. Uh, what they do have, they've built together uh, for the sake of somebody else. It works. If there's a, if integrity means it all is integrated, it all comes from the same source, and it's all going the same direction. Uh, those are those are my wisdom figures, and and a uh, hundred that people you've never heard of. So here I live in a house of mentors, of generations of mentors. This house was founded uh, in uh, 1956. It was founded by a monastery in Germany that was founded in 1035. And that monastery in Germany was founded by a monastery uh, in Europe that was founded in 700. And all those monasteries are still open, every one of them. The one who was founded in 700, who founded the monastery in 1035, who founded us, is still there. This whole thing is part of a huge process uh, I, I, there's a part of me that hesitates to use this metaphor, but maybe it's the most profound one we have at the present time. Those, um, those mountains uh, that are erupting in um, Hawaii and in uh, Guatemala, that lava that's gushing out of that is lava from thousands and thousands of years ago. There's something about this stream of lava that goes through the human condition. It is indeed what Joseph Campbell would call part of the mythos. These are the universal truths and we, we grow up in every dimension of this search and find one another there, just the way Merton did when he went to the East. These monasteries still gush lava. It's still going 
and it's all new, and it's all burning now. Lay people by the thousands relate to Benedictine monasteries because there's something about this simple place. We always say uh, the function of a Benedictine is just simple, and a Benedictine community is to live an ordinary life extraordinarily well. And that's all it is. There is no magic. There, there is no, uh, uh, no special knowledge. There is no internal secret. There is no code. We don't, we don't hold private meetings and chant uh, obscure words. We tell, we tell you how we live and what we're doing. And that's why we do it. And we've been here over 160 years doing it. So by this time, you ought to get the message. This is what it is. And I believe that, you know, there's a monastic strain in every major uh, discipline or um, tradition. The Buddhists have them. The Hindus have them. The Jews have a mystical dimension in the Kabbalah. Um, the Christians and, and uh, everywhere have, have some sort of monastic moorings. All of that has, has great meaning for me, despite the fact that it sounds, if not simple, simplistic. But I can tell you that Hildegard of Bingen, uh, a German nun from, from the 12th uh, century, is a big figure in my life. Catherine of Siena, Therese of Avila, but then so is Mother Jones, and so is uh, so was Martin Luther, and so was uh, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. I mean, these are people who had, uh, in my opinion, the integrity of of the spiritual, the intellectual, the psychological, the emotional, and the social. And it all came together for them. So out of nowhere, and despite everybody else, they simply stood up and articulated their truth and followed it, and followed it without attempting to hurt anybody else in their path. History, at its moment of greatest brokenness, always develops a cadre of saints. They come out of nowhere. They're like grass growing through cement. They're the people you didn't expect to find there. You don't, you don't have to come with me. I'm not going to push you out of the way. But you must let me through because I'm coming. I'm coming.